this evening. Um, I'm lucky enough to have known Rani Khan, I think, for nearly 10 years now. Um, when she, um, when I first read about her story back in 2008, and it coincides with the birth of one of my children when I was reading the paper, so I should have found that easier to remember. Um, so that's 12 years, I guess. Um, and over that time, um, Oz Harvest was already up and running and, and looking to move to Queensland. So I think tonight what I'm going to do is really get Ronnie to tell her story because she will be the best one to introduce herself. But um, it's important to understand that Ronnie has started this idea on her own um, and from one person has grown a charity that now provides food, not just to 1,300 charities across Australia, but also with a presence in countries overseas. And I'll get her to expand on that. But before we go any further, I'm going to get Ronnie to talk to you a little bit about, firstly, exactly what Oz Harvest is, and secondly, where that idea started. So, um, Ronnie, over to you. Thank you so very much. And before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I meet you all on the land of the Gadigal people, the Eora Nation um, here in New South Wales, but want to pay my deep respects wherever it is you are. And in fact, I'm going to share with you very, very briefly the acknowledgement of country I heard this morning from my three and a half year old grandson. We were in the Blue Mountains and he suddenly said, he calls me Safi, which is the Hebrew for granny. He said, Safi, come down, touch your hands on the earth. And he said, here is the land and we are the people. And I want to acknowledge and pay my deep respects. This is my three and a half year old saying, to, to the Aboriginal people and the Torres Strait Island people of this country um, because they've been here the longest. Do you know that, Safi? <laughs> and so I just wanted to share with you that it is really, I'm humbled to acknowledge and pay my respects. No, thank you for that, Ronnie. And I should also um, acknowledge the terrible people here in Brisbane and obviously um, that respect is extended everywhere where our members and friends are dialing in from tonight, which is um, Queensland, Adelaide, Canberra, Melbourne, Sydney, and any other places where they may be, because everybody, wherever they are the last six months is, is still there. So we're spread far and wide. So we'll yes. see if between us we can just um, provide that respect without knowing exactly where everyone is tonight. Yeah. yeah. So thanks, Jen. And Jen very humbly said she met me 12 years ago and very humbly didn't share that actually she was one of the drivers in supporting getting Oz Harvest Queensland up. So I just want to acknowledge that. But I, um, I ran an event company, a boutique event company, and I'd reached a point in my life for a whole lot of reasons um, that I, I wanted more. I wanted more from the work that I was doing and I wanted to understand um, really what my purpose was and what I had been created for. And I knew that it couldn't just have been to buy more shoes and to buy more clothes, although that was fun, and <laughs> to look after my family. And, and fundamentally, I had a problem daily in my business. I would put on beautiful events. You've all put on gorgeous events. You've all been at events. Oh, shit. Sorry. I thought <laughs> I was switching off my outlook so that it didn't... Oh, you're, no, you're good. You're good. And, and our, our, last, our, last speaker, our last speaker said two swear words. So you've only met... Yeah. So I've only done one in the first three <laughs> seconds. Okay. And it wasn't the worst one. Okay, cool. Um, anyway, and, and I had a challenge and, and in the event industry, one of the things that's the most common is that we prepare food. Food is about generosity, about caring, about sharing and about dignity. And every one of my events needed to have heaps and heaps of food so that my clients looked really generous and abundant. And that meant that there was always food left over. So I personally had started thinking and I'd reached a point that some of that, it just was unconscionable to keep throat, throwing away this food at the end of every one of my events. They were unique venues and there was just mountains of food. And one particular event triggered so much food that I just thought this is insane. 
and I started loading it up in my car and delivering it. And, and then through a whole lot of, you know, beautiful triggers, I reached that point that I knew that actually I could do something bigger and that perhaps this was it. But I, I, I stop here for a moment just to say to each and every one of you that oftentimes the way we find what it is we're destined to do, because I most definitely have, have found my sacred duty and what it is I'm supposed to be doing. When we solve a problem that a lot of us might have, but most times we say, why doesn't somebody, why doesn't somebody fix this? Why doesn't somebody do that? And, and Ronnie, I, you, you had a legal obstacle too to overcome, didn't you? Oh, absolutely. Because one of the challenges when we started picking up food directly from my events and then from other people's events, and they were all very helpful and everybody wanted to give us food. But then a couple of businesses kept saying, you know, just said, well, we couldn't give you food. It's, it, it, it's too, it would make us too liable. And so that didn't seem a good enough reason for them not to give me food. So um, together with a bunch of pro bono lawyers, we lobbied and had rule, the laws changed in New South Wales first then the ACT, then Queensland, South Australia, and the other states followed, which meant it became absolutely possible for anybody to donate food. And the quality food and the type of food we're talking about is food that had never been rescued in Australia before. Fresh produce, uh, produce that was left over from events or cooked food, as well as, of course, dry goods and um, fresh fruit and vegetables, but also dairy and also meat and fish and produce the quality of that our people had never seen before. But okay. even just, just, sorry, just one more thing, you know, when I started, there certainly wasn't a database of where to take this food to. You know, I called Sydney City Council and said, so, so I'd like to deliver food. And they said, oh, we, we don't have a list. So, I found a charity, the first one, and then said, who else do you know? And then they told me the second and the third, and then it, it grew from there. And Ronnie, it's, it's interesting. One of the things that I learned, um, because you put me on a food truck pretty quickly the first time I came down like a busybody to Sydney, was um, the quality of the food that um, I guess we throw out as a society is really high because there's this tendency I think I know I thought when we first started looking at, well, what food is thrown out to think, um, well, I guess you don't understand the quality and, and that I think I actually came down at Christmas. So, yeah. you know, you were getting beautiful lint boxes and cakes and hams and fresh meat. And, um, and can you explain a little bit why, because we know that there's, um, we know that we see drives at school for tinned food and for uh, what we call hard groceries. Can you explain a little bit about um, how Oz Harvest differs with the fresh food? Why yeah. that's so important and what good quality, what the quality levels are to paint the picture for people who don't know? Yeah, so I can't see any of your faces, but I'm just going to ask you all a little question. <laughs> all can, there. I know you're all there yeah. and you will all nod. How many of you have ever gone to the supermarket, looked at the milk on the shelf and put your hand to the back of the milk because you want the furthest date possible. So you don't want to take the milk that says tomorrow's date in case there's one further back that says four days times date. Yeah. Okay. So we'll talk about our responsibility in a minute, but the milk that, for example, has today's date or tomorrow's date, the supermarket owners know we don't want to buy. So we're talking about produce that is perfectly good. We never take anything past its, its use by date. And so if that milk was available and it said the 15th of July, we will pick it up until the 15th of July because you and I all know that there's nothing wrong with that milk and the chances are that milk will last another week. Your grandmother and my grandmother didn't have a date on our milk. We smelt it, we tasted it, and we knew that it was usable. So what changed with us harvest coming onto the picture was we took fresh fruit, fresh 
vegetables which were not being given, or he took milk and dairy and meat and leftover produce from events. So, for example, if I put on a magnificent event and 300 people were invited and only 275 showed up, we've all had those events. There was 25 meals that didn't go out. We're not talking about the food that's left on anyone's table. We're talking mm. about the produce that hasn't been touched. And so we would collect and do collect fresh produce. If you're in a boardroom and you order a boardroom lunch and you've got 10 people and you order enough for 15, now it's all very well. Some boardrooms will take the rest of that food and share it on the other floors. Some will just call us and say, come and fetch it. And that might happen on every floor. So it's that quality food that is absolutely extraordinary. And every single day I'm in awe when I see our trucks either come back or leave with produce that I would pick up from the supermarket. And mm. therein lies a challenge for all of us because the research shows that we as households throw one in five shopping bags of our shopping away. So just to give you some stats, in Australia, and these stats we know are not accurate, but this is what our government's talking about, and this is what is globally these figures, $20 billion worth of food goes to waste in Australia every single year, of which half of that comes from households. And do you think that figure's higher, Ronnie? Oh, we know that it's higher. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, but, but t somehow we've landed on 20, but it is higher. Mm. But if you think about it, the research also shows that, that every household would save approximately $4,000 a year if we were mindful about the value of food. But mm -hmm. one extraordinary thing that's come out of COVID, and I know that we'll touch on COVID big time, but is that in this last... 10 weeks, we have seen a whole switch in people's minds when they were stuck at home and a new value around food. Mm, people were mm. cooking more, people were baking more, people were valuing food more. First, we had the pandemic panic where people rushed into supermarkets and bought more than they needed. And I still believe that I should do reverse logistics and have every household that bought their thousand of whatever that they're never going to use and we should be collecting it and doing a reverse logistics drive to get that produce out of their homes mm. but that's a secondary thing but so so if something good comes out of COVID and I think there are many things that are good that will come out of COVID and have come out of COVID it is that notion that we as a nation have have a new respect I believe for food and, and mm. the statistics are showing us that. Um, Ronnie, for the uninitiated here, can you explain, because I think this, this, and again, I know for me, I didn't understand it until I saw it, but can you explain how Oz Harvest works? Because it is a little bit like when the run goes out. So in Brisbane, you can talk to sort of any of them, I guess, but I know in Brisbane, you know, there are a number of routes in, Queen, in Queensland that go out in different directions. And on that route, They'll pick up food and drop off food and pick up food and drop off food. And just the process of how it works, because um, the thing is, is it's, um, it's almost like a fingerprint. Every route is different. And some will have a big airport pickup of food and some will have an Aldi supermarket. And then you'll have, as you said, there'll be the city run with like small boardroom meals. And then there'll be big events held at the convention centre where there's you know, 200 meals in a corporate kitchen never served, you know, sitting in big... Or 2,000. Yeah, two, well, well, seven events of 500 people with yeah. hundreds of meals wasted. So can you just talk? Yeah. So we have, absolutely. So we have a fleet of over 60 vehicles across the country. Every single fleet, every single vehicle is driven by a paid Oz Harvest professional, professionally trained in safe food handling driver. And those vehicles leave an office if it's, Queensland, if it's Sydney, it's, the, it's duplicated around the country mm. and they leave with a particular route. So often I say, we're a, a transport and logistics company. We just pick up for free and we deliver for free. And so we go to arrange every vehicle might have 
between 10 or 15, and in some cases, 20 pickups. And that could be, it's all about logistics, it's all about efficiency, and that could be from supermarkets, from delis, from uh, boardrooms, from, it's, it's all about the direction and it's all about carefully planned routes or routes. And then with every vehicle having, whether it's five or 10 charitable organizations that they go to. So there's a very strong connection between the driver pickups and the drop off. So our drivers are so fundamental to us. They are not mm. just courier drivers. Mm. They, are, they are the face of us harvest because yeah. they are the face. And I know, um, like as a volunteer, we, what you see and probably we didn't, you know, again, you don't appreciate until you see it is they know exactly what each charity can take. So if you get, as, you, as Oz Harvest does get fresh produce that needs to be used quickly, they'll know which charities have kitchens and can take a large volume and have freezers and can use something like blueberries. There was a big delivery once and they're high in antioxidants, helpful for people recovering from addiction or low autoimmune and, and I was just amazed they were like a wealth of knowledge of not just the food but also what each of the charities needed what their clients needed um and, and with I mean we touched on COVID before that's obviously it, it's had a huge impact on everyone but for Oz Harvest um the events industry was one of those sectors affected overnight and aviation and can you just talk a little bit about the impact of COVID on Oz Harvest your clients and those sectors that feed into into your so let's just let's just paint a picture for 2020 2020 started with the started and continued with these absolutely horrendous bushfires and we need to recognize that during those bushfires more funds were raised than in any other fundraiser you know across for years and years and years in Australia which meant that by February, donor fatigue, now this is hugely important to understand that so many people had given so much money to food, to bushfires, that every other charity that then wasn't deemed an essential service, because now we are, we are now deemed and valued as an essential emergency relief organization. But then, although we did work, we weren't deemed an essential, so we got no funding for that. Um, so, so we, we started the new year knowing that fundraising this year was going to be enormously challenging. Our major fundraiser each year is at the end of March, and that generally brings us in around $3 million, which is very much part of our sustainable annual budget. Over and above that, we have another program called Cooking for a Cause, which is this wonderful um, team building event really for corporates. We get about 250 corporates through our doors a year who pay us for the privilege of team building. We've got one of the largest cooking schools in Australia. So it's a beautiful program, but brings us in about another two and a half million dollars revenue. COVID hit. So we, we're on the back foot with fundraising this year because all funds have gone to bushfires and you, it's hard to raise money. And then our event was supposed to be on the 31st of March. And on the 14th of March, I decided to pull it. Now the that's cooking, that's the, um, the CEO cook-off. That's our CEO cook-off. And that normally raises how much? Three million. Three million. Yeah. yeah. So we and you, you cancelled that early, Ronnie. What? Yeah, I cancelled that early because that event has 2,000 people at it. 1,500 of our recipients and about 250, 300 um, CEOs or business leaders plus another 200 odd volunteers. Reading the writing on the wall, I'm looking at COVID and I'm saying, there is absolutely no way this event is going to take place. So it's better to pull it early and be on the forefront than be scrambling at the end to wander. So we decided to pull that event. Um, and the following week, the government said no more events bigger than 500. And then slowly it went worse and worse. Mm. Mm. So, you know, as a leader, you sometimes have to make hard decisions and that decision 
felt like the right decision to make at that time for the protection of everybody involved with us, even though that early in March, we had no idea what we were dealing with. Mm. But so, that didn't mean that we lost $5 million. So, <laughs> what, what, so I mean, okay, so we're, we're, it's March, uh, COVID is happening, yeah. $5 million deficit, but what happened to demand with COVID? Um, because obviously charities shut down like businesses, charities. But within minutes, so many charities shut down and so many charities already right from the get-go had more demand and we need to take into account that in those first few weeks pandemic buying which meant that our one of our major sources of food which is the supermarkets didn't even know what hit them they'd had the biggest you know they had more they had the biggest christmas bigger than any christmas they've ever had mm. was by the end of march and beginning of april um, and so no so those, Yeah, so those donations you get off the loading docks of supermarkets all over yeah. Australia every day, what happened to that when the van backed up? Um, there was nothing. There nothing. was nothing. Now, the government had already announced its first business subsidies, uh, I think of 200 and, or 700 million. And I decided to lobby for our, for the charitable sector because it was very clear that if we didn't get a grant, so Oz Harvest has never purchased food ever. In 16 years, we've never purchased food. We've had enough rescued food to give out to those between 1600, it goes, it fluctuates to 1300 charitable organizations for a whole lot of reasons. Um, but I knew that if, if we didn't have food, so we lobbied government but we also lobbied for the charitable sector. And so I'm very, I, I, I collaborated, we pulled together some other major charities and sent off a petition as well as fortuitously, I had just met um, Matthias Corman a couple of weeks before. So I called on him and our sector got a, a, a lump sum now, it's very interesting, very, I'll share with you very briefly that Scott Morrison announced that the essential services and emergency relief sector would get $200 million. And he made that announcement with an Oz Harvest logo behind him. Mm. We got 3 million of that 200 million. Mm. But initially, everybody thought, oh, Oz Harvest just got $200 million. I mean, you know, the, the optics, you just always have to question optics and never just take things as they see. Mm. Anyway, the point is that we immediately got grant funding, which meant we could absolutely reinvent our business. We created a focus on food relief and co as opposed to just food rescue. That same two weeks, we got the biggest haul of food we've ever had when the hospitality industry closed. Oh, yes, yeah. Yeah, and I know here in Brisbane, um, the Howard Smith Wharves, which have been a massive success, and you know, I think one of the first areas they were worried about with crowding um, was that area, and they've been a big supporter of Oz Harvest in the past, and I understand they picked up 110 kilos of food from the kitchens there that shut overnight. So it was- We got tons of food from the airlines. We got literally, thousands of thousands and thousands and thousands of kilos. So that helped for that sort of second, third week while we were scrambling until the money came, until we could re, um, recalibrate. But I am so proud to share with you that first of all, we haven't lost a single person. My staff redeployed, we cut down, some of us cut our salaries, cut down to four days salary um, and immediately we created new programs based on the need mm -hmm. and those programs honestly it reads it's it's mind-boggling we created hamper hubs food boxes mobile markets um cooked meals we have cooked in the last 10 weeks oh god i knew that i my head was not I'm just going to find that number because it's, it's, it's quite extraordinary. 
um, Ronnie, um, it's, meanwhile... it's, it's a different it's a different um I also understand, and you can talk nationally, but I know here in Brisbane for the first time, because the office obviously delivers food to charities, it doesn't provide direct relief, but they were saying that they were getting phone calls from people who've never in, engaged with the charity and never needed help, just saying, look, I don't know who else to call, but I need food. Um, yeah, for the first time ever. So there's been a 75 in, in Brisbane, it's around 50, it fluctuates, but at peak, it's about 75% uplift in need that we've established 45 percent of our charities tell us that they're getting 50 percent more demand than they've ever had there's a whole new demographic of people who need food these are people who've never needed food relief before never thought they'd ever need food relief before um, not only that we're supporting international students with food boxes mm. international students there are 560,000 international students in Australia who overnight lost their casual jobs, lost their, their means of staying, and yet they bring us in such an enormous amount of revenue to our country. 46% mm. um, of those could not pay their rent and have not been able to pay their rent. So there's this enormous cohort so we've been providing food boxes and hampers to international students to those in the hospitality industry um, who who lost their jobs we've created partnerships with we call it hospitality heroes with the cooked meals so we've had chefs who didn't have jobs but wanted to do something cook meals and um, in sydney alone we were making between 10 and, and still are 15,000 meals a week. We've collaborated with every single, the Salvos, Uniting Care, Fax, to deliver food when they pick people up and put them, homeless people, and put them into motels and hotels. Yeah. We're delivering food to those organizations, to those individuals. We're doing home deliveries to individuals who couldn't get to charities. So everything about our model recalibrated. So, um, so just to get this right, so you, you, you started the year without your normal funding sources. Yep. The demand doubled or more. Um, our commitment. To service people you didn't That's already service. Yeah. yeah. So, so what, a, what a year. Yeah, it's been an extraordinary <laughs> year. But, but all I can say is that my team and the 200 Oz Harvest staff are the most extraordinary team. Um, the first thing we did was we decided, and I realized that communication is the most important thing under these uncertain times. And, and, and they're, they're, that is the only certainty is that we are under uncertain times and nobody still knows. Look at Melbourne, we don't know in New South Wales. I'm hearing from police uh, connections that within a week to two weeks they'll it's likely there'll be full lockdown back here again. You know, we don't in Sydney. Know. So you're in Sydney tonight? I'm in Sydney tonight. Yeah, yeah. And so it's, all I can say is my team redeployed my team, recalibrated and have our frontline, we didn't miss a beat with frontline. Our frontline staff and our chefs have worked every single day and we've continued to deliver food. We've changed the way with the, we deliver food, um, obviously, but our focus has been to add as many new programs as we can to reach more people. And if the funding, that 3 million, which we've used to purchase food and redeploy and create all these new programs, if we don't, and that was really only until Jul end of July, those programs will end. And all I can say is that we did a survey last week and 80 of the people we deliver hampers to the people we deliver mobile. We've gone into regional Australia with vehicles delivering food. Mm. Um, and 87% and of the survey said that they don't get food from somewhere else and that they're not sure where they will get food from if we are not supplying it. Now you've got um, Oz Harvest. Um, you know, it, it makes perfect sense that at the same time that you know before COVID and especially now that 
that the idea that charities buy food at the same time as the community is throwing it out, um, you've exported that idea um, yeah. overseas. Are you, what are you hearing about um, how they're handling food rescue in those other countries where you visited and shared the Oz Harvest model? So I'll share with you in particular the one that, that is, the, is the closest to my heart more because the need there is so extraordinary. So I was born in South Africa and left South Africa and never stayed to fight apartheid or do anything. So for me, opening South Africa Harvest was, was really a big thing for me. 19 million in Australia, 5 million people, soon almost 6 million since COVID, people need food relief at some point and some every day. So, I mean, that is a shocking statistic for Australia. South Africa has 19 million people a day need food. So South Africa harvest had really just kicked off. But in the last 10 weeks, they went from one vehicle to six They've got funding. They are delivering and doing the most extraordinary work. So, you know, it's, it, and it's completely, they, they're in touch with us every week and everything that we do, we're just sharing with them. UK Harvest, we shared our model. They have, they're doing exactly what we do, but it's a different level of need. Mm. And Kiwi Harvest, again, is, it's, they, the, Kiwi Harvest is, is lime green, you know, New Zealand is mm. 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 yellow and gold. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. But everywhere else is yellow and black, you know, our, our, it's exactly the same model, the same quality, extraordinary people, and the same impact. And I think that's the most important what we're talking about is impact. Number one, every dollar that we raise allows us to deliver at, at least two meals to someone in need. Now, mm -hmm. in, terms of, in terms of value proposition, that's pretty powerful. But we have mm -hmm. just had our SRO, SROI remeasured. For every dollar that's invested in our harvest, there is a $7.47 return to community, social return on investment, mm. which is very, very powerful. And I mean, you talked about the saving to households as well. You know, the average household wastes 4,000 a year on food that's never consumed. One of our members has asked the question, um, there are services um, like HelloFresh and yeah. like that, that deliver food to your door, just what, yeah. you know, what you need for the meal. Um, with clear instructions and, and that obviously encourage people to cook at home and cook fresh. And the question they ask is, do those sorts of services reduce household waste because people, I guess, because people are planning their meals or thinking about what they're going to have? Um, because the, and then another member has said, because obviously the packaging is an issue as well. So yeah. what's your response to our behaviour as a community and what we can do? Okay, so my response is twofold. So the people who can afford HelloFresh are affluent um, and are making a choice about the way they want to cook once a week. I, c I wish I could say to you that because somebody orders HelloFresh, they're not wasting food. The chances are that they bought other food as well for the rest of the week. Mm. Um, but there's no doubt that that service absolutely changes one's mindset about what's necessary for a meal. When you have what you need for a meal, mm. then you start training yourself also with your shopping habits. Yep. So I think, so given that pre-COVID and post-COVID, one of our commitments on the one hand is to minimize waste, but on the other is to educate all of us citizens on halving our food waste. Australia, has committed to halving food waste by 2030 because of our harvest. We took it to Parliament. We got our Minister for the Environment, who was then Greg Hunt, subsequently Josh Frydenberg, committed. So our harvest is um, Australia is committed to halving food waste in line with the United Nations 
um, sustainable mm. development goals. So we're working hand in hand with that commitment, but then upskilling vulnerable people. So we've got very um, deeply ingrained um, education programs mm. that are both about teaching all of us how not to waste food. We've got programs that go into schools. So from, you know, there's absolutely no doubt that as citizens, because citizens are also politicians and citizens run corporations, the more we can understand the value of food and how much we waste, it will be a ripple down effect. But the person who mentioned the packaging of HelloFresh or those services, and I'm not calling out HelloFresh, is a big issue. Um, I don't personally get HelloFresh, but two of my neighbors do, and I see the boxes go, the boxes and the packaging are in the recycled bin every week. Now, it's true mm. it's recycled, but it does add to the packaging. Mm. But, you know, um, you've got to weigh up. Yeah, it, absolutely. Um, we've had another question from a member, Camille. Um, she said, is there any research that shows whether someone's socioeconomic background impacts the amount of food they waste? And I know the NEST program is targeted at people who are not affluent. Um, yeah. and, and teaches them that actually eating fresh food and buying carefully saves money, but is also better for you. But do, you, do you, I guess, so there's two questions there. Do we find that the less someone has, the more careful they are? Um, and, oh, and does that impact on the amount of food they waste? But I think I, think I know what you're going to say about this, that for you, you say it. Look, uh, that it, it's a very interesting challenge. There's absolutely no doubt that if you've got more food, you waste more food. I mean, that 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 corollary just stands to reason. Um, and unfortunately, the lower socio incomes are not are buying more processed food and are mm. buying food more tinned food, you know, food that does have a different lifespan to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, it is, a, it, it, the, the challenge is the education around healthy eating as well as sustainability and environmental impact. And yeah. That, and that, I know, um, very complex. It's very complex. These things to shift and change our behavior. Yeah, and I know that um, I'm, you know, I'm, I know that particularly in lots of countries, often the food that a time poor parent um, can provide is frozen, exactly. expensive, um, but not always. But but at the same time, those families can't always afford to buy bulk simply because there's a limited amount of money available each week, but also a limited amount of time because they might work long hours, but in a low paid job, catch public transport, and as you said, very, very complicated. Um, a, another question we've got here from a member of ours, Narelle, and I'm just going to see if I can unmute Narelle. Um, can you do that, Bridget? Otherwise, I've got her question written down. I can, I can unmute myself. Oh, but there she is. She's unmuted. So Narelle's one of our members, and she's got a question for you, Ronnie. But actually, Ronnie, I think my first question I had you've answered, and that's really addressing the number of emerging groups that pre-COVID weren't identified as vulnerable. And that's a real signpost, I think, for women and change as well about, you know, those, potentially those groups, for instance, international students weren't particularly visible to us. And, and so that, thank you for that. Cause I, that's something I, and, and people who work in hospitality who, and people who work in creative industries and that sort of thing. Artists, musicians, yeah, all you know, of all fallen completely through the cracks. Yeah. So, um, so really, um, I guess the there's there's one question that I wondered is just how do you so quickly? How did you as a team so quickly pivot and be able to change your complete model? And that's it's it's extraordinary, really. Yeah, I'm incredibly proud of my team because we recognized immediately that we needed to. And us harvesters always considered and prided ourselves on being agile and nimble. Um, our four pillars are rescue, educate, engage, and innovate. And our innovation 
piece has really always been about making sure that our impact is the biggest and adding value. Mm. And so for us, it was a case of food rescue must continue, but we must have another source of food. And with that source of food, how best to use it. So the best way to use it was to make ready prepared meals, because all of a sudden, many of the charities that we were delivering to were not able to provide food. And people still needed food because many of them didn't have the capacity to cook for themselves. Mm -hmm. So ready prepared meals was high on our priority list. Our free give our free supermarkets. We knew that um, handing out hampers of fresh produce again in localized areas, these pop up hubs. Um, and I, I know that Michaela. We've, we've been doing some of that in Queensland, but certainly in other cities, um, making sure that ready made that fresh produce, beautiful, healthy boxes. These boxes are divine. I, and I'm, I'm just going to share a, one of the major corporates decided to prepare, I think, 20,000 boxes. And literally the quality of what was in them, they offered some of them to us and we said, thanks, no thanks. You know, it was sugar, it was biscuits, it was cookies, it was sweet. You know, our, our boxes have got lentils, they've got Quaker oats, they've got pasta, they've got oil, they've got healthy beans, things that, and recipes that go with them to tell you how to prepare, as well as fresh produce. So the boxes we've delivered, as I say, over, over, 30, 40,000 boxes, if not, if not more. And I literally am not, I've, I've lost my page mm. with all the stats on. Mm. So really- oh, and, I, and Ronnie, we'll be sending an update to everyone as well. So we'd love to gather all of that um, and send that to everyone. And if you don't mind, share across our platforms because I think it's- love you too. Because honestly, when I sent that update to the minister that invested that 3 million in us and said, I just want you to have a look at what your money has done. I mean, it fed way more than 6 million meals, way more, way more. And so each one of those, so Narelle in answer, you know, it was, would this be useful? Yes, what is it gonna to take to do? Can't deliver education to schools, let's turn our education program online. Mm -hmm. That spent, took a couple of weeks and that then was delivered to teachers and to homes. Mm -hmm. um, produce, so I think, I think we have innovation in our DNA. Um, you know, I, I, I'm an entrepreneur. I didn't, we've, we've launched a program that's rolled out in Sydney that at this point is a pilot, but we will do it across the country and it's Harvest Bites. And we've been making ready-made meals for sale on a Monday to those people delivered out so you could purchase meals cooked by our beautiful chefs mm. so you know out of out of crisis comes opportunity and we we realized we needed to pivot and and i started saying one thing that i wanted to share with you all because i'm sure many of you if not all of you are in some form of business and and michaela can comment on this but from day one i decided the most important thing was to communicate with all staff so every day, every day, there've been maybe five days we've missed, but communication goes out at around four or five every day with an update on either where we're at, what we've seen, something new, just keeping the team cohesive. Because when you don't, when you're not connected face to face, it is different and it is the most important thing to keep the team as a team knowing that the needs are being met, that we're listening, that we're hearing, and that we're supporting, and the impact of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So that comes, I mean, probably could become a book at some point, just because mm -hmm. <laughs> every day there was, and, and may, maybe Michaela wants to comment on that. Michaela's um, our, one of our, our queens. Yeah, I might, um, have we got Michaela unmuted there? Here I am, Jan. She is. And Michaela is um, now, how many years have you been with Oz Harvest in Queensland, Michaela? I think my second birthday is next week. Okay. Well, it feels oh, like she's been with us forever. 
Yeah. So, so, Ronnie, do you want to just um, throw to Michaela that question again? For I just wondered, are you, you got our comms. Yes. I, mean, I get feedback, but do you want to share what that... Oh, absolutely. There's a couple of things that OzHarvest has done in the face of COVID and internally in terms of that, that team engagement piece. And the first one is the accessibility mm -hmm. of our senior leadership team. So every work day of the week, we get an update from a member of the, the senior team, whether it's Ronnie or our head of operations or our head of impact. So that kind of accessibility at a, a senior level, it, it's available, we can pick up the phone, we can call them. They really have gone above and beyond in terms of making themselves personally accessible to everyone right across the business. And the second thing that I have really enjoyed has been the internal updates. So Oz Harvest as a team moves quickly as fast as we possibly can. There's too much to do to sit around. But as we've been doing things, as we've been experimenting, we've been sharing those updates internally, visually, so we can see what it looks like. The Hampers is a great example. So um, Sydney and Melbourne have been doing an incredible job with their pre-packed hampers over the last few weeks. We're about to start those hampers in Brisbane, being able to see how their program looks and works as a logistics business has been really powerful because we really have been able to learn uh, what has worked, what hasn't worked, so that now that we're ready to start our program in Brisbane, we've had all of that benefit of, of their own experience. Mm, it's such a big, um, it's such a big knowledge community. Uh, can I ask you to wait there, Michaela, because I'll, I'll get you and Ronnie to um, answer, both answer the next question, if that's okay. Um, so one of our members, Rachel Stewart, has a question. And Rachel, I think you're unmuted if you want to ask that yourself. Yes, that's right. Hi, Ronnie. My Hi. question is, what is your advice on how to engage and maintain your corporate relationships um, when your usual pathways haven't been available? Because obviously I'm hearing from you, there's lots of communication strategies that you've swung around and put into place that you haven't had to do as intensely before. So I just thought for anyone working in this sort of space, what's your advice there? So we've done the same with our corporates. We kept connecting. We kept fine checking in with them, touching base. How are you guys doing? Not for an ask, but just to share, telling them what we were doing. And so again, as Harvest has always prided itself on, a fam on its family values. And it's not just for our staff, it's for those we engage with. And that is our food donors as well as our, our financial donors. And so, and our, our corporate engagement partners. So we've literally spent time making sure that they understand where we're at and we understand where they're at. If you take into account that a lot of our partners are from the industries that have been the most hit. Yeah. Airlines, hospitality, because that was a natural partnership for us. Mm. So that has been and will be a very, that's been a, another big hit for them and for us, but we needed them to know that we care about them. And so again, it's, it's just he, treating all of those people the same way as I treat our extended family, which is communicate and over communicate. Because I hear what you're saying. Well, it's obviously sounding like it's been very successful and coming out of this, you'll possibly be in a much stronger position because of the authentic nature of the relationships that you're talking to about. Yeah. Yep. I think yeah. so. I think so. And that has always been about that integrity of the, those relationships. Mm. And Michaela, obviously in 2019, um, Queensland launched um, Cakes for a Cause for the first time as a new initiative that was meant to run again this year and, and as part of that shared knowledge that Oz Harvest loves, you know, be shared more broadly. Um, so you've obviously had a change here in Queensland in um, the, the funding cliff, I think if we can call it that. Do you want to talk a little bit about what relationships we that exist here in Queensland to support food rescue and what's different for you this year and, and what you've been able to do in difficult times? Yeah, it, certainly a lot of what Ronnie spoke about, it, it sits here in Queensland. So having to hit pause on Cooking for a Cause, which was an enormous and growing, very quickly growing program for us here in Brisbane, not being able to have that, that income or indeed to host our Cakes for a Cause event this year, it's just not the right time. But 
because of that integrity and, and that genuine nature of the relationships that we've built through Cooking for a Cause and through Cakes, we continue to maintain relationships with so many of the businesses that have been involved. So when I think about Cakes for a Cause, a lot of the beautiful chefs that made amazing birthday cakes that we delivered to charities uh, last year, they're lining up to participate in our Hospitality Heroes program, making beautiful cooked ready-made meals for those in need at it's so special for us to be able to pick up the phone. And that is, that's one of the, the most satisfying, but also most comforting parts of my job is that when something, something unexpected happens or something goes wrong, we really do have that confidence in those relationships to pick up the phone and say, hey, we're facing this challenge. What do you think? What suggestions do you have? Is there someone that you think we could speak to about trying to work through this? Yeah, and I, I know, um, and actually I can see him from my office here, um, Philip uh, Johnson at Echo, who was our first chef, I think, to sign on with Cakes for a Cause. Um, I saw him come up and he collected all these unemployed chefs and had them in his kitchen. So at the same time as he was having to close but pivot but try and do takeaway and he pulled them all into his kitchen and started cooking for the front line and then pivoting cooking for charity. Yeah. So it is a, it's interesting that... Um, so much of what our, our harvest does, and I think someone used the word before, um, authenticity and the direct connection that, you know, Ronnie's built from the very beginning of knowing, you know, very intimately how food gets wasted means that even in that, in what's been a really difficult time, people seem to have helped. And I saw an article in today's paper. Now, last year when we were planning cakes around this time of the year, a liner at Arc Dining won a chef's award I think like chef of the year yes and today in the paper she's um talking about opening a pop-up in Noosa because her restaurant is closed her job is gone and Noosa is close to home at Gympie where she used to be and I think that is such a great example of how how much life has changed um we've got a question I'm just going to um have if we can unmute Sarah Goodman Sarah are you unmuted or the Goodman family Okay, to unmute them, we'll wait. We'll wait for them to pipe up. And in, but in the meantime, um, is that is that um, Mr. Goodman James there? It is. Sarah wanted me to ask the question, Jen. That's all right. James, James is a friend of Women and Change. He's an honorary um, woman. He's brave. He's a brave man. <laughs> hey, Rony, um, Rony, thanks for speaking. I've enjoyed your. Um, presentation tonight. I was interested, we were talking before about the huge change in your organisation. Um, what do you think the level of demand for your services will be in the next couple of years and, and how is that going to change Oz Harvest? Well, we already know that, and the reason we've been running these surveys and the reason we're really trying to understand what happens when this program ends is what happens to those people <laughs> who've who we now delivering food to that we possibly that we weren't um we see that the demand will only go up certainly in the next year um you only have to look at today's stats that 200 people are applying for one job um and so that means 199 aren't going to get them and that means they don't know where their food's going to come from or their pay is going to come from these are people who've never been in that position before. So we want to not be the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. We're trying to ring fence at the top of the cliff. But there is absolutely no doubt that this cliff is there and that we, our services, and this is the conversation I'm trying to have with our ministers and I'm on a, a national the uh, charities crisis cabinet with 20 other major organizations across the board. I'm the only food rescue representative. The others are every aspect of philanthropy or charitable organizations. And we can see that the demand is enormous and is not going to end. And that if JobKeeper and the government does not continue to support there will be way more work for government to do because philanthropy 
on the one hand, we've had the most extraordinary philanthropic response. We, we launched a, a campaign called Here for Hope, and it's been more well patronized than any other campaign we've ever had during this time. Clearly, some people who received 750 or job seeker, some people who received job keeper were receiving more than they'd ever earned and felt the, the capacity, had the capacity to give. But all of the research says that philanthropy is going to go down and the need is going to go up. So it's a, it's a long answer. The short answer is we believe that the 75% uplift that we've seen in need is not going to go away. And that's across the board, whether it's food bank or other charitable organizations that I'm dealing with, Uniting Care, Salvos, Red Cross, coupled with bushfires, with drought, with flood, then COVID, we're, we're facing a severe challenge to people who, those who were in need, but those who are newly in need. So Ronnie, when we, I mean, we've got a series, there's this aid that's pro being provided by the federal government to a lesser extent, the state government. Um, do you have any key observations about um, how that aid is impacting the audiences you need to look after and how the withdrawal addition or extension of that will change um, the way you need to respond? Um, Absolutely. I mean, my submission to government last week was, this is what we've done in 10 weeks. If we stop this now, you tell me, what do I tell those people? <laughs> mm. And how do we, so we are planning to certainly keep some of those programs going, but right from the start, we had to say to, you know, there's 600 people lining up tomorrow, 600 families lining up tomorrow at an, a new hub that's opening in Sydney for, ha for boxes. Mm. We know this, we've had to, have, we've got security. We've now, you know, the whole rollout of these. So what are they gonna do? Mm. Mm. And how are you, um... Oz Harvest obviously had channels to reach um, the government community, the business community before. How, what channels will you be using or what are the messages you need us as a, as a community to hear if we are to cope with that next one to two years that James has referred yeah, to? Yeah, thank you. So I think that first of all, individual funding, whether it's $10, whether it's 100, don't ever think this, that it doesn't have an impact it is enormously powerful. And when a hundred people give $10 or a hundred dollars, it's amplified. So some of us can give time, some of us can give food and some of us can give little bits of money. So it's all of those things that are needed. Mm. But mm. The, the, the overarching message to government is whilst we'd love our, while our economy, you know, <laughs> If I look at what our government did, it, it, initially it didn't react. Then it reacted with humanity, and then it reacted for the, for the sake of the economy. And you cannot have an economy without humanity. Mm. And quite honestly, we're in this challenging situation, and whether the deficit goes up a little bit more, but more people are helped at this point is really, I think, what's going to have to happen because otherwise the hole that is created is bigger than anyone could ever have perceived. Mm. And Rani, you touched on that, you know, even the smallest amount makes a big difference to a family that receives a meal that they might not otherwise have had. Um, probably the last question we've got tonight comes from, let me find this. Um, so this question comes from, Cannon Hill, Liam and Mariella in Year 6, uh, in the, the Social Justice Committee leaders in Year 6 yeah. at um, Cannon Hill Anglican College. I think I've got that right. And what they've said is, how can our school support Oz Harvest? Thank you for that exquisite question. So first of all, if you're years 5 and 6, your school needs to get the FEAST program. 
So our FEAS program is free at the moment this year to schools across the country, and it delivers sustainability, nutrition, and a pro teaches, creates climate activists, young, young warriors. So number one, they should be telling their principals and their teachers that they want feast at their school. Number two, they can do fresh produce drives. They can do canteen drives. They can do a gold dollar coin drives. But again, the van will come. The van, it's, it's very real. They can, they can have someone from Oz Harvest come and share at the school what the impact of what it is that they, if they collected a box of dried goods, we'd share who that's going to and the impact of that. Yeah. So we love um, schools get engaged. And, and big people, have you got some homework for big people? Not, um, and, and again, like on saving food, but also on what can we do to help those people who are, and I think you said it, it's, um, it's humanity and it's dignity. What, what, does it, what should big people be thinking about in regards to being part of the solution in Australia? I think that there are two parts. Every single one of us needs to value our planet and needs to understand the impact of every time we do throw away an apple or throw away a banana. You throw away a lettuce into your garbage bin, it takes 25 years to decompose. You put it into compost, it takes two weeks. This is an important thing to know and to understand individually. But from, an, from the humanity point of view, of course I could say, you give us a dollar, we can deliver at least two meals. But if you don't believe that we're worthy enough or you have other charities, support charities. Don't ever think that money isn't an important way. Often we get calls and people say, you know, I don't just want to give money. Well, of course, we take time as well. And through COVID, it's been challenging. But post-COVID, volunteer your time, volunteer your services. Jen, you know how powerfully fulfilling it is when you've been and collected food mm. and done it. Your children have watched. Become role models for your family. Mm. You know, whether it's in giving the $5, giving $500, or helping your kids to take a can to school or mm. sharing that their kids that don't have or putting our feast our, our getting, making sure that our Lenny and the Ants book is in every school. That's mm. our little kids book on sustainability. It's an exquisite book. If you guys don't know it, order it. It's beautiful. I say to people, if you're one, if you know anyone who's between one and a hundred, that book is for you because it's based on a fable and it teaches you how not to waste food through, through the eyes of Lenny the kangaroo. Yeah, Lenny, um, and yeah. Ronnie, it's interesting. We, our, our first conversation, um, because we had to reschedule you actually, um, was Sarah Davies, the head of Philanthropy Australia. And she said something that resonated with a lot of us. And we were talking about it at this month's committee meeting for women and change. And what she said was, when society has really difficult problems or really big problems, the philanthropic dollar is worth more than the government dollar. Okay. And, and what she said to us um, back in, in June was when you give a charity a philanthropic dollar, um, they can use it differently, flexibly, okay. powerfully, um, because she said, understandably, the government's funds are, are a taxpayer's funds, so they have to be spent in a way with the limitations that respectfully taxpayers expect. And that this year, um, what she was seeing was a more mature response from philanthropists who'd been through the GFC, and they've said, we may not make the same contributions to our vehicle, whether it's a trust or a fund, yeah. um, but we're going to increase our distributions even if we can't increase our contributions going in, we're going to at the very least maintain or increase Absolutely. over the next two years. So we certainly hope that happens. But I know as a group, we, we took that on um, because our grant, and you know, it, it's, it's 50,000 each year, hopefully more. We've got a record number of members as at June 30, which was a, a great surprise to us. But we all feel very deeply the responsibility of making sure that all the decisions we make this year and in the next few years do it with that value and understanding that that philanthropic flexible dollar has to be invested in things where there's um, potential, sometimes risk, but where it's 
be important to invest in a solution. And it sounds like the, the, the challenge you're facing is enormous and will require some creative solutions. So I want you just to know one other thing that prior and pre-COVID, Oz Harvest had relied on government for between three and 7% of our funding annually for the last 16 years. This is the first time that we've never relied on government. I've always known that I never wanted to rely on government. Mm. But in this particular time, it was crucial to go to government because we needed quick fix and they were handing out money. Mm. But there's mm. absolutely no doubt that philanthropic funding has so much more power because one, it allows organizations to utilize it absolutely in the very best way. I think also, Ronnie, um, in this instance, you were the solution to their problem. There's and not even any doubt. Just, and we still just the it. scale of, of yeah. Oz Harvest um, and the connections and the deep understanding of hunger and people who are in need, you were actually the solution to feeding a whole new community. Absolutely, um, so. and we still are. And so from that point of view, yeah, we've, our priorities have extended to food relief being one of our core pillars as mm. opposed to food rescue only. Yeah. Now, we'll, um, we'll have to, to close off shortly, yep. but I just wanted, before we do that, I just wanted to mention to our members, we've launched our grant. Um, so applications for that have opened. So if there's anyone in our community who wants to look at that $50,000 grant, we ask you to, to go to our website and have a look because it's an expression of interest stage at this stage. So please go in and also share that with other people who might be interested. Um, membership is open still. We did have a big push before June 30 and we're really blown away. Um, very, very happy. Highest number of members we've ever had at June 30, which I can tell you is not um, like most people, the, the response we thought we might get and what's been an extraordinary year. So we hope that that, that, that grows. Um, and, and while our target before COVID was to double our numbers to 100 this year, um, we're really happy with that response. But we just want to make sure that everybody understands that membership actually remains open until the 31st of October. So please do join us because for that reason, the philanthropic dollar is probably more in need in, in this year than it ever has been before. So giving with us and magnifying that impact is so important. And again, all the details are on our website or Facebook. Um, but before I, um, I finish up tonight, I just want to say a, a special thank you to Ronnie because um, it's been an extraordinary time. People have had to pivot their business. They've had to move families. They've had to sometimes, um, some people have lost their jobs. Um, and, and while Australia has, you know, up until the last few weeks been really untouched, you know, some people have lost their health and lost their lives. So I think um, to know that, that those Australians who require humanity um, have had that help of Oz Harvest during a time when some of us have, have possibly not been thinking about um, not, not not thinking about others, but, you know, when we've all had a lot on our minds, it sounds like you've certainly picked up an enormous task, one that you already carried every day that doubled in size, um, and then went on to not just help those people, but do it with creativity and dignity, which I think, and, and the, 90, the fact that you're 90% philanthropically funded means it's probably just part of your DNA to be creative, elastic, responsive, um, which is why it's the organisation it is today. So on behalf of everyone, thank you to, to yourself, Michaela, and all of our, our members who've contributed and listened um, and our community who've asked questions. Um, do you want to have any final words to our group if there's anything you can leave us with tonight as we think about um, hunger as really that most base need and that lack of food that we're going to see as part of our landscape the next one to two years? Look, I think that what I want to leave you with is you have all joined this group and are on this conversation, but every one of those conversations because you're enlightened, because you are conscious human beings. And all I can say to each and every one of you is thank you, because it takes people like you to allow people like me to do what it is that we do. And whether it's me that you support or another organization like ours, I just want to thank you because the more you can duplicate what it is you do, the better so the society is that we live in. And I have a little phrase and I, I haven't got time to share that story with you, but I will share that my book, my memoir, which I never knew I'd be writing, is coming out in September. 
It's called A Repurposed Life. And it does share that particular story, but it, it, it really, my message is each and every one of us have the ability to enrich our own lives by doing for others. And you're already doing it. So I just want to thank all of you for being part of Women in Change and Change. And I want to thank Jen for being such an extraordinary role model and such an important support system for me personally and for us Harvest. Oh, thanks, Ronnie. But, you know, if ever I want to feel like I haven't been doing much with my time, I just talk to you <laughs> and anyone else in the team. But thank you so much, Ronnie. Um, on thank you all. And thanks, Michaela, for giving us her time yeah. tonight. My team are extraordinary. And the only reason I shine is because I've got magnificent stars around me. That is oh. the Thanks so much, Ronnie. And look, everyone, we'll be putting some information on our Facebook site over the weekend so you can see things like Lenny and the Ants, look at the figures that Ronnie's talked about, they're staggering, um, and also just connections through to any of the other programs that Ronnie's mentioned tonight, as well as Oz Harvest Nationally and Oz Harvest Queensland. So thanks to everyone for participating. Ronnie, thank you all. We're glad we, we didn't have to only hear your voice and we got to see your lovely face with your strong Sydney internet connection. Um, so thank you to you and on behalf of everyone else, have a, have, a great, um, have a great evening and thanks for joining us for our second conversation with Women in Change. Thank you all and go on to do many more. Cheers. Bye. Thanks, Ronnie. Bye.